Hello there. Today we're looking at Fnet mixing tokens with Fourier transforms by James Lee Thorpe, Joshua Ainsley, Ilya Eckstein, and Santiago Antanion of Google Research. I know I'm a bit late with this one, but it's sort of a not only this paper, but it's a really interesting direction that's happening right now in machine learning in general, in deep learning, in sequence models, in image models, and so on. And that is the sort of giving up of attention mechanisms. So for the longest time, uh, we've been focusing on transformers. And in a transformer, you technically, you have some sort of a sequence as an input, and then you push that through these attention layers. The layers are actually always made up of attention sub layers and then feed forward uh, layers. So every layer would have an attention sub layer and a feed forward sub layer or multiple ones of them. Now the feed forward sub layers, they would be sort of acting individually on the elements. So the weights are shared, there is one feed forward layer, and the tokens, every token goes through that feed forward layer. So this can be efficiently parallelized or sharded, or you can make things like mixture of experts where tokens go to different ones. There's a lot of stuff possible. However, here in the attention part, this was always a bit of a thorn in the eye of most people, because while the attention mechanism is definitely a cool mechanism, it needs a lot of memory and compute. In fact, the attention mechanism needs to decide which information in this layers uh, sequence goes to which information in the next layer sequence. So where does the information go into the next thing from this token? And then from this token, does it go here or here? Who knows, the attention mechanisms job is to figure out what information goes where it's a it's a routing problem. And as such, it has a complexity of O of n squared is if n is your sequence length. And also it has memory requirements of O of n squared. And that prohibits it from scaling to larger sequence lengths. So we would always be sort of limited in the length of the sequences in which we could input, uh, or which we could input, which prevented it, for example, from being applied to computer vision for a long time, until people figured out, actually, we don't need to put pixel by pixel here, we can just sort of subdivide <laughs> our image into patches and do that. And then we can use the transformers. But still, this limitation of the sequence length is a result from the attention mechanism having this complexity uh, right here. And people have been chipping away at that complexity for a while now. So we've had a, a about one or two years now of constant invention of uh, linearizing this attention mechanism. So to get that from O of n squared to some O of n, or maybe n log n or something like this or something manageable, maybe a constant, maybe n times k, anything but n squared. So we had linformer and longformer and reformer and synthesizer and uh, I don't even know if synthesizer is in the same area, but performer and <laughs> um, uh, linear transformer. There, there's so many uh, what what would be called linear or, or non quadratic attention mechanisms, trying to approximate basically this attention routing problem. Now we've entered into a new era. Now people are questioning, do we even need the attention layer at all? And I think the or one of th this, this comes all comes at very, very similar times right now. So even after this paper, there there has been like at least three papers since then, um, trying to actually just actively get rid of the attention layer in the sequence models, which is super, super interesting. So we're going to have a look at how do you get rid of the attention layer that has apparently given sequence models such a boost? And what do you replace it with? And in this 
particular paper, the answer is very much Fourier transforms. Now, we're going to get into why Fourier transforms, but essentially they present a model that looks like this. So it looks very much, if you've seen my video on, on attention or, or anything since then, this should look very, very familiar to you. Namely, there is an input down here. Then uh, the input is split into words, sequences of words or word pieces, maybe. Um, and then each of these word pieces gets a word embedding. So this is a, a table where you look it up, it gets a position embedding, and maybe it gets a type embedding. So if you want the most direct reference, maybe go watch the video on on BERT. Right. Okay, so the, the next step then is n times this layer right here. And this is where usually the attention would be. So, it, but instead of the attention, this would be here. Now you have this what's called the Fourier uh, layer, or, or whatever, we're going to look at this in, in quite a bit, the output is a dense layer and an output projection and then an output prediction. So as you can see, this is very much like a transformer, except it says Fourier instead of attention. So just so you're aware of what's going on, this is the this is the thing they change, they, they don't change any other thing, except this sub part. And what is this sub part, this sub part is characterized in this formula right here. Um, but essentially, what you do is you have your input to the layer, right? So x, x would be whatever goes into the layer right here. And then of course, this would be like x zero, and then x one would be go back in n times. All right, so x what is done? This is a Fourier transform. So you apply a Fourier transform to x. Now you might ask, how, how can you do that x is not a uh, a like a, a continuous signal like a sound wave or something like this. Remember that the way we view sequences here is as a series of vectors. So every input element at the bottom will get mapped to some sort of a vector, uh, as many vectors as you have tokens. And as many dimensions, that's that's something you decide by yourself. So you, you're going to have a bunch of vectors right here. And you do a Fourier transform first over the well, let's see, first over the hidden domain, and then over the sequence domain. So you do a Fourier transform over this domain. And then you do a Fourier a one, so a 1D Fourier transform over over this domain, right, um, each individually, and then a 1D Fourier transform in each dimension, but across the uh, time domain right here. And that's it, there is no parameters involved in this thing. This is simply a Fourier domain in the time domain and a Fourier domain in the hidden dimension domain. And that's all. And the only learned parameter in this whole setup are, I guess the normalization might have some uh, affine parameters, but these feed forward parameters are then the only learned parameters. Okay, this is quite a departure. Now, if you if you are a bit confused, um, let me go a bit more into this Fourier transform, you might first of all, see right here, that we are only interested at the end in the real part of the output of the Fourier domain. What does the Fourier transform do the Fourier transform, what it usually does is it takes some some sort of a signal. And it transforms that in a reversible linear fashion into a let's say a superposition of um, of these basis functions. So these basis functions in, in the case of Fourier transform, they're uh, these, how do you call them in, in English, these, these, uh, like sine and cosine waves of different frequencies, right? Very much what you're 
might be used to from the position encoding. So the Fourier transform would give you that the top signal is like three times this plus five times this plus nine times the the bottom one. Okay, so the this signal right here would be transformed into this signal right here. And you can do an inverse Fourier transform as well. The formula for the Fourier transform is is pretty simple. This is it, you decide how many components you want, you can represent any signal exactly if you have infinite components. Uh, but you know, as we deal with real numbers, we just cut off somewhere. And then you have the Fourier transform and the inverse transform is simply uh, if you don't do the negative sign right here. So you can in fact do this by simply constructing this matrix here ahead of time and then multiplying by this matrix. And there you really see this is just a linear transformation of your data, okay? And you, you do it once column-wise and once row-wise uh, to your signal. And there you have it, that, that's, your, that's your, your layer, no learned parameters at all. Now, why might this work? Um, and the, the second part of the paper right here uh, that we, are have, we, we didn't really look at yet is what they call mixing tokens. And they make an emphasis on this. And I think, I think it's really smart. So this paper isn't about the Fourier transform. It, it is not advocating that the Fourier transform as such is in any way special. Rather, I think what they advocate for is that the mixing of tokens is special. So the mixing of information between the tokens. Now, what do we mean? So if you have a sequence, any sort of sequence, and you want to do computation with that sequence, if you want to understand the whole sequence, at some point, information needs to flow between the elements of the sequence, right? Now, if you look at an image, for example, it is, it's quite natural to, or let's, let's go a different way. How does a convolutional neural network flow information? Well, a conv convolutional neural network sort of restricts information flow to a neighborhood. So what it would do is it would let information flow in this neighborhood and uh, let's do non overlapping kernels, maybe in this neighborhood and then this neighborhood. And then in the next layer, right now, there's only three elements in the next layer, it would sort of let information flow in this neighborhood. And also, let's include that twice in this neighborhood. Now there's two elements, and then it would let information flow like in this neighborhood. And then you this node right here has sort of a global overview over the whole sequence, whereas this node here only had an overview over a local subsequence. We accept this and for images, it makes a lot of sense. This is exactly our prior for images is that what's first and foremost relevant to like a pixel here is probably the surrounding pixels. And then the objects, if, if the image contains objects, they're probably sort of in the neighborhood ish of of that broader area and so on. And then on the highest level, we want to, you know, the relationship of objects to each other, we want to understand that. So that seems like a natural prior to have. However, in text, it's a little bit different, right? Um, in text, it might very well be that here at the end, I, uh, if, if anyone has ever tried to learn German, that here at the end is a word that just kind of references in like intrinsically as a as a first layer of information, the second word in the sentence or something like this, uh, like a, a verb helper verb construction. This this is very common in language. So there is not at all this locality of 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 information given. And therefore, routing information fast between elements of the sequence is very important, uh, especially when it comes to language, but it also is important in images, because as we've seen the vision transformers, they also work quite well. Um, so routing information between stuff is, is, is very uh, 
very helpful in, in language. And this locality might not be as helpful, it might actually be damaging. If you only get to learn about your distant, uh, distant away tokens, you know, three, four or five layers down, that just limits your ability to do computation. Now, the attention mechanism is exactly right, what facilitated these connections between elements of the different uh, across the whole sequence, right, because it an analyzed every single possible connection between two things. And then it decided, okay, uh, these are, you know, the important connections. What this paper is saying, and I guess other papers that have come out since like the, the MLP mixer in and, and the uh, pay attention to MLPs and, and also this is, you know, it might be, uh, it might not be so important to decide exactly how information should flow between far away elements. It might just be enough for most tasks, if information flows at all, right? If, if we just somehow get information from one side to all the other or from one token to all the other tokens, then, um, then we, we, uh, we facilitate this transfer of information. And that might be enough, the exact routing might not be as important as the fact that information is flowing. And that's what the Fourier transform ultimately does right here. Because if you, um, if you transform your time domain, right, this is step one, step two, step three, step four, if you transform this, uh, then a little bit of, of, of the one token is, is in, is influencing this number, a little bit is influencing this number, a little bit is influencing this number and for two, three and four as well. So the time domain is completely destroyed, right? But the, the frequency domain is split up. And then in the next step, when you do a Fourier transform, again, you do very much the reverse, you sort of go back into the time domain, even though I'm, I'm not convinced that applying this twice, like in the next layer, again, will bring you back is that is that the exact reverse? I don't know, someone, someone, with uh, more knowledge of this should probably evaluate if I normalize correctly, is applying this twice and taking the real part after each one equivalent to performing the Fourier transform and then it's inverse, I'm, I'm not sure. What I'm sure of is that um, this, this, the Fourier transform will absolutely stack the time domain on top of one another while splitting up the frequency domain. And if you apply it again, it will do the, the opposite. It will stack all the frequencies on top of one another and split up the time domain. The signal is the same, but the feet forward layer are applied differently. Remember the feet forward layer is applied individually, right? To, so there's one feet forward layer, one box, and it's individually applied to each of the elements of the sequence. So the same transformation. Now, what happens if you do the Fourier transform, and then apply the feet forward to each element? Well, now the elements, each element is no longer corresponding to a token, but each element is corresponding to one frequency across all the tokens in the entire sequence. So now, the alternatingly the feet forward, um, the feet forward layers can work on the individual tokens, or on the ind individual frequencies across all tokens. Right. And I think uh, th this is the same. This is a bit like, you remember, we I, I don't even remember what it was, but we had we had attention. So if you look at an attention matrix, uh, axial attention, that was it right where you if you like, if, the, if these are like two pixels, uh, the attention matrix between all the pixels would be too expensive, but you calculate sort of the attention in the columns and the and the rows. And then it takes two layers because first, uh, that pixel can attend to this one. And then in the next layer, that pixel can attend to this one. It's a bit like this, right, where 
um, you get anywhere, like you can route information from anything to anything in two steps instead of one. The reason, so that that's what the Fourier transformation does. Now you might ask why the Fourier transformation? And to be honest, and I think that's also the opinion of this paper right here, uh, and I think they say this in the conclusion. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna skip a bunch of stuff right here. Um, they, I think they say they've looked at other transformations. So we found the Fourier transform to be a particularly effective mixing mechanism in part to the highly efficient FFT. That's the fast Fourier transform. It is quite remarkable that an unparameterized mixing mechanism can yield a relatively very accurate model. On a practical note, we only performed a cursory survey of other linear transformations. Therefore, we believe there may be value in exploring other fast transformations. So the Fourier transform was chosen because it was readily available in libraries, uh, but it is, it is just a mixing technique. And I'm even, I'm even open to the idea that to Fourier transform is like the optimal mixing technique here uh, of all the linear mixing techniques you could come up with. But what seems to be important is just the fact that you do somehow get information um, around between the tokens and that you operate sometimes on the individual tokens and you operate sometimes across the tokens with your transformations. And for a lot of tasks, it might not be that crucial exactly how that information is routed, right? So I think that's the, the sort of takeaway message uh, from here. Now, with, with respect to experiments, um, it is not better than transformers. So just say this from the beginning, we've, we've quit the era of I want, like, here's a new state of the art, and we've gone into the era of it works almost as well, but it is faster. And also in a very particular plot with very particular axes, it is better. Uh, you're you're going to see that. Not that it is bad, right? But uh, essentially what they claim is, look, we have something that's way faster. You're going to sacrifice a bunch of accuracy for that. And depending on your task, that might be worth it or not worth it. So the, here's the stuff they compare. Uh, BERT base, which is uh, the transformer model they compare with. The FNET, which is we replace every self-attention sublayer with a Fourier sublayer as described in section 3.2. That's what we just looked at. Uh, then a linear encoder. This is interesting, right? Let's actually first, let's go like, there's a random encoder. We replace each self-attention sublayer with two constant random matrices one applied to the hidden dimension, one applied to the sequence dimension. So this is just like a constant scrambling. Um, this is this is like the Fourier transform, except it's less structured. Like it's just kind of a, a random thing. And that's why I say the Fourier transform might be the most effective non-parametric mixing method here, because it, it kind of makes sense. And I, I do think it outperforms this random encoder quite a bit. Um, and then there's the feed forward only that only does feed forward that doesn't do any mixing at all. Um, yeah, there is no token mixing, as you can see here. The linear encoder, we replace each self attention sublayer with two with a two learnable dense linear sublayers, one applied to the hidden dimension and one applied to the sequence dimension. This, I mean, this is the this is the MLP mixer. Now I get it. MLP mixer was specifically for vision, and you know people might have tried this before. Not saying they invented this particular thing. They might have. I don't know. But this is exactly like it's it's funny that this appears again right here. In fact, when you look at the results, this linear encoder performs quite well. Um, it of course has more parameters, right? Because this one has no parameters instead of attention, whilst the linear encoder actually does have parameters. It's just not as compute and memory intensive as attention. Um, so what works well is this linear encoder works quite well, uh, which gives you know gives credit to MLP mixer as well. 
And also what works well is what they claim later a hybrid version. So when they use the F net, but at the end, they like in the last few layers, they actually use attention. So again, this is, it's not better, it's a trade off. And the trade off is speed and longer context size for accuracy. So if yeah, here you have the here you have the number of parameters. Um, and there you go with the first loss. So this is pre training loss, right? So pre training loss in, uh, in masked language modeling, and next sentence prediction, and also uh, accuracy on the right hand side, you see, Bert is Bert is just winning here. Uh, the other ones aren't like, <laughs> not even close, right? I guess a bit close. So you can also see that the linear here outperforms the F net. Interestingly, the F net outperforms random way. So it's not like, it's not like any mixing is fine, right? Yeah, that's the interesting part here. Uh, because the random one is whatever, like just mixed information. Um, so that that is interesting to see. And that's it gives hope that we might come up with even better transformations than the Fourier uh, transformation. Um, yeah, we, um, I guess, didn't the synthesizer also try to learn the attention matrix? At that point, I said that doesn't make sense. But maybe, you know, we find some sort of universal or whatnot attention matrix that is just better. I have no idea. I'm, I'm just talking crap now. <laughs> And then you can see that the hybrid here also performs fairly well. Uh, but this is just pre training for now, if you then okay, the speed up is I mean, speed up is, of course, a lot. Um, there is a, you know, a decent speed up on TPU and a massive speed up on GPUs. So, you know, that's, that's where these models shine, they're very fast. Um, in terms of evaluating these things, this is the glue benchmark. It's a bit, you know, I think it's debated of how useful these benchmarks really are, but it's at least a number you can measure. And you can see that BERT is very much uh, winning in most of them, though there are some where it is not like, okay, I, like, I don't even know what these what these tasks are, but I, they the authors here say, especially, for example, in the BERT large case, um, the this is quite unstable. So this is fine tuning, by the way, they pre train on the uh, on the big corpus, and then they fine tune right here. This can be unstable, for example, for example, look here, like the BERT large is actually worse than the BERT base in this one, which I guess is only due to training, training instability. But they did say they they tried a bunch of times. I guess I, I guess it's also a factor if the, a model is unstable, right? If you really want to go into production with it, that's an issue. Um, so you might opt for something more stable. So you can see that in most of these things, Bert wins. There are some times where something else wins, like Fnet or Fnet hybrid, uh, though. Keep in mind these these benchmarks. Um, sometimes they are they are rather just like a benchmark, like a number. Uh, in overall, Bert wins qu by quite a bit, though it is followed by the the hybrid model, and then the linear model and the Fnet model aren't too far behind. Um, also, if yeah, if you look at the large one, though, I think the BERT large one is simply kind of bad because it's unstable. So this might be more of a training instability issue than the fact that this model is somehow um, exceptionally good. Yeah, it's, 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 it's quite interesting because I also compare these numbers to to Jacob Devlin's original paper, and they were quite different. Uh, the glue numbers. And so I'm, I'm a little bit wary about just these numbers and, and just sort of thinking of, 
know how much variance do they actually have between different implementations between different runs and so on and that sort of um, makes me a bit cautious with these uh, things they do as I said so here they plot masked language model accuracy versus time per training steps for 64 examples in the log scale and in one region of this plot they are uh, the fnet and the linear net are better which is i i hope you agree with me it's a rather specific plot to plot and even in the conclusions they say something like you know for a given time and for a given time and accuracy budget here <laughs> we demonstrated that for a fixed speed and accuracy budget small fnet models outperform transformer models which is okay there, there's like a measure where you have where you're better which is cool right but <laughs> at the same time i think the the message is really that here's a trade-off that you can do lastly they evaluate on the long range arena so the long range arena is sort of a textual task where it's somehow important that um, you remember things for a long time or that you can address uh, sequence elements over large distances so there's like list ops these are not necessarily natural language tasks but more like constructed tasks with the explicit goal of testing the long range capabilities of these models and um, of course, transformers see, still seem to be best. But of course, the, the question here is very often if you have long sequences, you can't use a, a transformer. And therefore, you have these other models that you can see are not too far behind, but they do use considerably less memory and um, compute. And they don't, yeah, they don't run into fail as often they train way faster. So I'm also a bit skeptical of this long range arena results because it, it sort of it sort of seems like as, as, as soon as you can remember whatever it is you need to remember, you, you sort of solve the tasks. Um, so there, there's not there's not like it. It's more a bit of a binary thing. You either get there or you don't rather than there being um rather than there being some sort of nuance to it right now uh we might get once i guess once we get more robust models that work on longer sequences that might change in any case yeah it's cool to see that you know you see in the average numbers these models are not too far behind the transformers and they train way faster as i said Okay, so that was it um, for this particular paper. Uh, as I said, this is a, it is a paper about a Fourier transform instead of attention, but it's much more a paper about the importance of mixing uh, information between tokens. Uh, that, that is an important concept. Um, and the available trade-offs that there are tasks, there are situations where you don't need the attention mechanism. You don't need this full power, this full analysis. And in those cases, it might be enough to just somehow mix the information. The Fourier transform being one attractive option because it doesn't have parameters and it has very, very fast implementations. And it sort of makes sense on a conceptual level. So. That was it from me. Uh, do check out the uh, paper uh, that they provide. And I think they have code too, if I'm not mistaken. And if not, it's it should be relatively easy to uh, implement this. All right, that was it from me. Bye-bye.